Welcome to the lesson seven uh, about filling the earth of the interlocked Bible study. And uh, just a quick overview, we started in, in Genesis 1 with creation and uh, have worked our way through key Bible events, events recorded in scripture as history, historical facts. And we have um, as we go through this biblical narrative, this story offers an alternate um, uh, story to what is common to, uh, to our society. Our society offers a different narrative, a different story, a different explanation. And worldviews are derived from these stories, these narratives. They're called meta-narratives, the overarching story of how we began, what is going on now, and how things will end up. And it provides all of the, con the answers necessary for us for, for life. And so uh, people ask the questions, why do we get sick? Why, why is there death? Why, what, why do we get married and have children? What, uh, um, what do we do afterwards? Um, what is wealth? Um, uh, what is health? And so um, these, this narrative, overarching narrative is what provides uh, the framework for us to understand. And as we construct this biblical narrative in our own minds, providing uh, greater clarity to uh, the alternative to what we hear in universities and, and um, perhaps within our society, or, or a society that is uh, within an animistic context, uh, remote ethnic groups have their own narratives. As, as, we, as we gain clarity, it gives us confidence in this thing we call the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures. It gives us confidence. It gives us peace because of how well things fit together. God put in our hearts a conscience uh, and, and a, an innate ability to be able to, uh, to be drawn toward him and, and truth in that sense. Although we may not have been raised in, in a truthful environment, we still uh, there's something uh, in our hearts that that uh, that help us understand that and, and are convinced that this is really true. Uh, I believe that to be the Holy Spirit, God Himself, uh, prompting uh, this this sense in our our own hearts that He is the ultimate authority. He is the one we are to go to for information and for for answers for everything. And, uh, and, and therefore, when, once people are drawn to him and, and accept him and walk by, by faith in his word, you will see transformation of life, like just complete transformation take place in our own lives and in the lives of those who, in, whom, in whose heart God is at work. So now as we, as we approach this, uh, um, this story today, this narrative, as, as we close out the, the, the story of Noah and the account of the flood where God brings judgment on the people that he created, he, he brought them about to bring uh, his glory, to, to glorify him, to, to reflect his character. And but when Adam and Eve chose to not listen to God and his word in the in the Garden of Eden and chose to listen to a snake, a serpent, a deceiving entity called Satan, uh, Lucifer, when they chose to listen to him over God, they fell into the natural consequences of those actions and they drifted away from God. God God's, uh, although they were created in his image, they be, they were separated from him and, and fell under judgment. And God separates uh, uh, evil from good. He, he will not allow evil in his presence. And so God provided a solution. And we see this, this pattern happening uh, over every, his, every story in the Bible repeats the same theme where when man seeks to find his own solution to reconciliation with God, God rejects that. God rejects man's solution. 
and he he in turn get provides the solution and man is is obligated and responsible to res, to believe god and 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 accept his way over man's way so we see this this happening over and over and it's going to happen all the way throughout uh, this this biblical narrative that we study it's 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 futuristic as well we can pretty much predict how salvation will incur will be will be set into motion into future events that we have not yet experienced but yet have uh, uh, are recorded in scripture in the book of revelation you can predict basically how things are going to play out in that man is always striving for his own way seeking his own ideas and how that turns out terribly wrong uh, when it's not God's way, and that God is the one that provides the solution, and that we come to Him. So we see as we uh, finish up this this narrative of Noah, how Noah and his family found grace in the eyes of God, and God provided Noah with sufficient information as to and as to how to be saved from this um, this worldwide flood that he decided to send on the earth to destroy the evil. Uh, so Noah believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness, just like it was with Ad, uh, Ad Abraham. We'll study in, in, in a future lesson here, lesson eight and onward, or nine and onward. Um, as uh, w w this, this, he was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, he, he was, he was found righteous and faithful. He believed in God and, and, and the consequence of his faith was the construction of the ark. If he did not believe in God, he would never have constructed an ark. That would have been foolishness, but he believed God took him at his word and, and was therefore saved. He and all of his family and, and also all these animals as well <clears throat> um, that came two by two on the ark. <clears throat> we noticed in the last lessons that that was feasible. It was possible uh, as God didn't put um, all canine uh, species uh, and, and breeds, I should say, breeds on the ark, but rather an ancestor, a canine ancestor from which all dogs have, have uh, um uh, all breeds have come from, and in a similar fashion, all the other animals in a similar character trait, feline, uh, um, dinosaur even, and, and so many of the animals. So God saved and preserved mankind, but we notice that, uh, that man is, is, is still carrying something with him. So God's, God, God brings judgment on evil, on the whole, all of creation. He brings judgment but we see problems afterwards. More problems come out from uh, from afterwards, and and it's and and it proves to us, at least, God has proven to us that the solution isn't just complete and total um, uh, liquidation of mankind. The solution is that that man's has sinned, and sin is the what has to be addressed. Okay. Sin is the issue here, the root cause, and we, we established that in past lessons. So now, now God, in his grace, uh, uh, is proving, is going to prove that his word is true and trustworthy by setting up a contract between himself and Noah and his descendants, that he will never destroy this land again, this earth, with a global flood. And God has kept his word uh, to this day, uh, thousands and thousands of years later, he has kept his promise. And then he places this uh, rainbow in the sky, something that had not shown up previously um, in, in, in the way God had designed earth pre-flood and now post-flood uh, after this collapse of a canopy of water above earth and the waters below the earth. Uh, after this catastrophic event, um, we have uh, more similarities today uh, as to what it could have looked like in the time of Noah, although what we see today is very different from Noah's time post-flood, we still see some of the same character traits, like a rainbow, for example. And, and this rainbow 
uh, we talked about how it has been perverted. The sign has been perverted by so many other narratives uh, as and what it symbolizes and what it means. But it, this, this was God's design to, to demonstrate his glory, um, his, his uh, beauty, his creativity, his, his, his holiness, and how he set up aside in this uh, uh, throne above all creation. And, uh, and it, it is to give mankind peace in knowing that, that God's word is trustworthy. And here's the sign that, that, that surpasses all of these years. So uh, that, what, that was designed to give us comfort and, 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 and joy and peace in the knowledge of God and his word. So now we see a, a, fourth, a fourth divine institution introduced as well. Uh, we, the th first three were designed to build and construct society with responsible dominion, marriage, and family. Now God adds a fourth element that he, he institutes called civil government, the ability to, to, um, uh, to exercise um, um, the penalty of death, the death penalty um, over men, over other men. Um, punishing them for their evil acts. God instituted and in, in, uh, this divine uh, institution to be able to restrain the evil of man. That was not set in place before the, the flood. Now, and, and we saw what happened that, that when man did that which is right in his own eyes, complete uh, uh, catastrophic results. Evil man. Now, um, now God institutes civil government with the ability to uh, punish evil and exercise that government to governance um, and, and therefore restraining man's evil. And it works. It really works. Uh, uh, all the governments of the world exercise a level, maybe not to God's stipulations, but they do exercise a level of authority over, over, um, over their, their citizens. Uh, henceforth restraining the evil within society. So God's way is good. This is how God instituted. And I believe uh, wholeheartedly that if God had not instituted these things, we would be, we, we, we may not even be in existence today because man would have been so corrupted once again in such a short span of time uh, that it would have been impossible to sustain, sustain society. Uh, so God, we're going to see how God in this, in this lesson seven, in the latter part of this lesson, how God institutes a fifth, a fifth divine institution, which we'll look into in a little bit. So it restricts the spread of evil and, and it's working to this day. So here in our timeline, we're still early in our in our, our study of the interlocked Bible study and, and in the, 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 the complete narrative of the scripture. We, we covered creation, the fall, the flood, and the next the next step is going to be uh, the city of Babel and uh, this tower that was built. And we're gonna we're gonna look at that at the latter part of this lesson. But let's complete this part, this flood. Let's bring it to a conclusion as to what life looked like post flood or immediately after afterwards. It was a fascinating period of time. It was a period of time that that is in, very difficult for us to describe. It's there is so little um, recorded history from that time frame that uh, we have to use some uh, things that we know today and and use some ancient um, recordings that are that that are available to anyone and and help kind of reconstruct some of the basic basic framework of that time so what we are doing here is is not we're not going to get dogmatic about exactly how things were in that time frame but we're going to get we're going to find hints hints and indications indicators that definitely definitely provide an alternate narrative to the evolution uh, and naturalistic uh, worldview so because there's so little information, what the evolution uh, 
uh, theory does, and again, this uh, emphasis on the word theory, is they reconstruct and then provide it as, as gospel truth, in, in irrefutable truth. And, and if you ever try to provide alternate uh, theories uh, to within an within a evolutionistic uh, university context, uh, you will, you, you, you'll, you'll get thrown out, you, you'll get uh, um, shamed. There's so many things that happen um, where, where it's completely rejected. Hardly any conversation uh, can happen in those, uh, in those environments. But here we see that there indeed is an alternate narrative to evolution, uh, evolutionistic ideas and naturalistic ideas, and, and one that does indeed uh, coincide with the biblical narrative and the biblical account. Although we don't have every piece of the puzzle together, we can definitely see that there's consistency here. So first of all, you see this pre-flood environment and in contrast with the post-flood transitional period. So we're going to call that a transitional period post-flood. And, and, and it's because catastrophic things happen in, in the natural world uh, as, it, as it is adjusted to its new context. Uh, so if God created everything perfectly in perfect balance in this with this uh, possible water canopy above, watering the earth with mist. I mean, you're, you're talking about this greenhouse effect where God created earth perfect, right? And then the post post uh, catas uh, catastrophe or post flood uh, things looking completely different. Uh, we have mountains and valleys that were lower in the time of uh, early on in creation. Volca no volcanic activity. Oceans were warm. Temperature was pleasant and mild. Uh, you think about it. Adam and Eve didn't even have clothing. Okay, so why would God make uh, 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 have Adam and Eve l exist without clothing if there were extre extremities, extreme of uh, cold or extreme hot? It doesn't make sense. So God created a temperature where where plants and animals and people would thrive. Um, the glaciers were not mentioned in land or no specific information. So you, you, you compare that to the post flood and you see there's no longer a water canopy. Rain and snow are now prevalent. Mountains are higher and valleys are deeper. Um, and we see the, the Grand Canyon today where we can go visit and you can see these deep gouges out of the earth uh, that, were, that were created, that were generated from that time. And you see great volcanic activity and ash covering the earth. So, so temperatures would have been very low without the sun penetrating the warmth of the sun. You have oceans that are much warmer because of all of the volcanic activity from underneath the earth. So I don't know if it was boiling water, but you have a lot warmer. And then you have these extremes in weather, extreme hot and extreme cold, creating the, the perfect environment for glaciation. I guess that's how you say it, glaciation in, in so many areas. And, and uh, the surface of the earth was also much different and, and had different uh, uh, opportunities for migration, which we'll look into more detail, but uh, uh, such as uh, a shifting of the surface on the, on the crust of the earth and also the existence of land bridges. So uh, things were much different. Let's look a little bit more at this uh, at this time frame. So the lifespans of the people were uh, is the very first thing that that we notice. Major major changes are taking place, and and I'm we're, we're in the lesson. We're going to get into a little bit more detail further on, um, but just take a glimpse at this this timeline here, where Noah lives 950 years old, which is consistent with pre-flood ages. Okay, and now his son Shem. It's recorded that he lived up to six hundred years old. So drastic uh, differences. Dr you're already dropping three hundred years. A direct descendant of Noah, who was born pre-flood. Um, now, in the descendants of Shem, and you've got all these generations right here. We see up uh, eight generations, all the way up to Abraham. How just how Shem is outliving outliving all of his grandkids <laughs> uh, up to the eighth generation. So he, he outlives, 
uh, outlives his son. Uh, that's that's mind boggling. His son lives 438 years old. Um, our our Bashad, and uh, his, his he outlives his grandson Shila, uh, and and Peleg, Ru, Shru, Nahor. All these guys are dying off before their great 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 grandfather. So we're talking about some major differences, a, a unique period of time. Where, where, where people lived on earth that were short live, short livers, short lifers, and then long lifers. Uh, and again, we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. So you see, you can kind of see on this chart, which is commonly used in, in, in different uh, studies, physics, chemistry, electronics, and, and you see this, this uh, transitional uh, 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 kind of like a curve where pre-flood, uh, the Adamic period, uh, people are living very long time. In this transitional period, you see between Noah and Joseph. Joseph, okay, the story of Joseph. That's that's in, now you're now you're talking about uh, Egyptian uh, e the Egyptian time frame where there's a uh, um, uh, pharaohs. Okay, so in the in this period of of time, the age bracket is dr dropping drastically. Uh, people are dying much earlier. Uh, and and then post Joseph, uh, it kind of kind of levels out. It kind of levels out, and even to this day, although our our lifespans, we're we're happy if we get to 80, 90 years old, and then we really celebrate uh, individuals that uh, break through to one hundred years old, and 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 then you get your name in the Guinness World Book of Records if if you go on beyond beyond a hundred and to hundred and ten. Uh, so, so the age age bracket for this time, we really celebrate that. But uh, but you see the drastic drop here. It indicates that uh, there's this major decay taking place. And perhaps you've heard of the second law of thermodynamics. It's consistent with that in that everything everything is in this kind of status of decay, and um, and 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 it's consistent with it where where things that are that are complex begin to to um, decompose and and to break down and and we see that in our earth people are really worried about our environment today and with good reason because we indeed are talking six thousand plus years since uh, since this time now we should be. Uh, if this is consistent with God's uh, God's design and what how things are happening, we should see some significant de decay in our Earth's quality uh, as life are, uh, as as the years go on. So it's no wonder why we are as human beings, uh, uh, as a global community, worried about this and concerned. It's by good good purpose that we're worried about it. Man has also uh, made some terrible choices that has accelerated the deterioration of our, our, our natural environment. So it should not come as a surprise to us. And, and, and let's not condemn as Christians those who are advocates for uh, preserving certain uh, species or, or, or revitalizing the earth by planting trees. Let's not be critical of our, our, our brothers and sisters that are doing that. Instead, let's find a biblical framework to, to do that in the most effective way possible according to God's plan and rules. So you see anyway this transitional period taking place. So Shem is extremely old. If we want to put that into perspective, uh, you're, you're 600 years old. That, that that would mean that if he was born, um, if he if he died today in 2021, then that means he would have been born in 1421. So uh, when when was it that uh, uh, supposedly? Um, uh, the Americas was discovered, although that is very debated as to whether what, what, what who discovered what here. But, um, but, but Christopher Columbus, that was in 14, 14, was it late 1400s? Yeah. Okay. So you're talking about uh, Shem, a, a human being who, 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 if we put it in today's perspective, could possibly have been on the, on the, 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 what's that called? Um, the Pinto, are there those three three boats that the uh, ships that um, was a part of the um, the Christopher Columbus's group going out his his um, um, 
yeah, anyway, discovery. So if uh, he could have been on that boat and still lived today to tell us about it, and that, I'm just trying to bring this into perspective, right? He, he could have lived through multiple wars and, and the rising of, of, of global leaders and the, their falls as well and lived to tell us about it. So in perspective, um, we have uh, we have a fascinating point of history. So I, it, it is possible that the people of that time considered Noah, uh, his three sons, their wives, their immediate children, uh, especially those coming off of the ark, though, as gods and goddesses. Why why do I bring this up? Because in so many cultures around the world, you see this, this idea of, uh, of I- immortal men and women, gods and goddesses. You see in Greek mythology, you see it in, in, uh, in Egyptian uh, uh, religion. You see these immortals. It could be, it could be that these, these beliefs ha- were rooted in that in this time frame, there indeed were men and women, Noah, his wife, etc., and, 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 and immediate descendants, were alive for so long. It's like these guys are never going to die. What's, what, what's the deal? Nothing's going <laughs> to, nothing kills them, man. They're, they're, they're hardy. Their bodies are amazing. They're constructed well. They seem uh, um, immune to all these diseases now. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, it, it could be, and again, we're surmising here, that, that a lot of these religious systems of gods and goddesses uh, came from um, that time frame. And of course, if you, if you believe in this continuity of being where uh, men and gods can, can move up or move down on the scale, uh, then, then that would uh, facilitate that type of belief. <clears throat> So here's another issue we want to address as we go through this time frame, and that is uh, whether this, these civilizations were primitive or advanced. Were, they, were, these, were, these, uh, it, were these ape-like people uh, um, with, without the ability to even exercise clear communication? Ooga, booga, booga. Og, og, hungry. Uh, you know, uh, I'm making a, a light of this, but think about the 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 um, evolutionistic idea, naturalistic concept is that man, over a period of millions and millions and millions, millions of years, evolved into more complex beings. But the biblical narrative is the total opposite. It's the total opposite. Very, very in uh, complex creation beings, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, were created in the image of God, who is the author of all science, all nature, all of the, what we see, the complexities of molecular construct and, and um, uh, to the most micro, micro level, to the most macro level of the universe. This God, intelligent being who created everything, created man, man, not animals, man in his own image. So we have the total opposite of, of the, the, the evolutionistic, naturalistic perspective, and even many animistic uh, ethnic groups in their religions, uh, uh, the opposite of what they're saying. And we didn't come from animals. We, we are descendants of Adam and Eve, and then later Noah and his descendants. Uh, we come from that. And these are advanced societies. So they could not have been primitive. Although, do, did, they, uh, did they have an iPhone back then? I don't think so. Did they have uh, uh, Bill Gates making um, Microsoft and, and the personal computer? No, they, they didn't have that type of technology. Uh, and so we're not talking about that. We're talking about intelligence here. Um, obviously, through time and, and sharing of information, uh, our tech has grown exponentially at a global level. Uh, we're even like Chinese and, uh, and, and the Americans, although there's so many opposition there intention, you still see tech 
tech being traded and 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 building off of each other ideas. Uh, but in this in this time frame, uh, man is extremely intelligent, even though they're not necessarily utilizing electrical force or or, or electronics like we have uh, today. <clears throat> But they had other tech, I'm sure, that uh, maybe has been buried, <laughs> buried and, and undiscovered that we don't know about. Uh, I just throw that out for the fun of it. But, so, no, mankind was not uh, um, uh, uh, ape-like in that sense. Hey, here's, here's, uh, here, here's some biblical um, content that promotes this idea of, of, a, of high society. So just briefly, uh, I'll go over Genesis 4, 17 to 22. It's talking about Cain here. So Cain had sexual relations with his wife, and he became and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. And then Cain founded a city, which he named Enoch, okay, after his son. So he Cain's found, founding a city. Do you think that takes a little bit of uh, uh, intelligence to figure out how to design a city and and to set it up so that it's sustainable of course this is complex stuff here enoch had a son named irad irad became the father of mahula yell mahu mahu jail became the father of mathu shail mathu shail became the father of lamech and then lamech married two women the first was named ada the second was zillow okay now you're seeing some uh a guy with two wives that's that's uh something that was then introduced later uh and then ada gave birth to jabel who was the first uh, of who raised livestock and lived in tents okay so there again there's some we're not talking about these these uh, uga booga cave dweller ape man type people here. We're talking uh, of people who are uh, raising livestock um, and multiplying their wealth in livestock. They live in tents, so they've chosen to design a tent that that is comfortable to live in, that they make their wives happy. You know, as they maybe move around as nomads. Uh, his brother's name was Jubal, the first to play the harp and flute. So wait a second here. We're talking music here, art. Music and art evidently is an ancient, ancient, ancient thing. I wonder why, if, if we were created in God's image, would we not express song, music, dance, uh, uh, the appreciation of melody, of course, because God created us that way. So he invented the harp. Wow. Uh, and, the, and, and the flute. Complex instruments. I've tried to learn how to play the arp, harp. Uh, I can play the guitar, but the harp, it takes some coordination. You use two hands, there's, there's lower notes, there's higher notes, and, and you pluck them, uh, each string independently. Uh, to make melody and, and to do that in a coordinated fashion takes some skill. Uh, and what were these uh, strings made out of, I wonder? Hmm? Uh, so someone was using his, his head to generate uh, a, a string that could give clear and sharp sound. Uh, we're talking about high level tech here. Uh, Lamech's other wife, Zilla, gave birth to a son named Tubal Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain had a sister named Nama. Okay, so he became an expert in, in forging, molding, melting down metals, mixing metals and alloys so that they, they had longevity and that it could be useful and, and moldable and, and, the, and that these tools could be could be used for practical means. Uh, um, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to poke a lot of fun at this, but let's be practical. Uh, it wasn't this caveman that all of a sudden uh, discovered fire. Ooh, ooh, I'll cook food now. You know, we're not talking about uh, primitive mankind here evolving into greater complexity. We're talking about very complex men using the creativity that God gave them and 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 the tools that were on the earth to add value to what god made add value to make to invent new things and that's that has a continue continuum all the way into the present and we're going to see i believe in the future some additional text tech uh technology coming out that's going to blow our minds away 
um, I, you know, I, I think of the older generation from today are already blown away by the tech that's present and, 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 and now within our, uh, the palms of our hands. Imagine what uh, the next 10, 20, 50, even 100 years could look like for mankind in, in that sense. So, so, no, we're talking about very, very advanced civilization. Now, I want to look at some of the, this uh, post-flood world in a geographical sense now. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, there's this time frame that is called the Ice Age, which would have happened in this period of time. Is you know how in uh, naturalistic uh, science, um, with an evolutionist uh, evolutionistic theory, uh, the Ice Age is is a period of time where where it, you know essentially it covered the earth. Uh, um, but we have this, with, with this biblical narrative, we have this time frame where the Ice Age indeed, uh, uh, we, you know, as Christian scientists, we agree that yes, it happened. There's an Ice Age. Um, but we also agree that it, it happened in this particular time frame post-flood, that this is the most feasible era in which that took place. God, when he created the earth, did not create earth chaotic and within chaos he created it with order so chaos came post post creation um as as man lived under the 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 dominance of satan and and the power of sin in their lives and separate from god you see chaos coming forth as a consequence and then post flood uh you're going to see some of these consequences as well so uh Here's some interesting maps, and if you could kind of uh, look at the screen, and, and I know this looks like a uh, just spot on the screen, but you can see, I don't know if my, my mouse is, can be visible here, but you can see some of the shape of, of uh, South America right here, and you got Africa on the other side. This would all be water. That's why there's ships here, but here's the interesting fact. You see that, that there's this land bridge between the South American continent all the way down to Antarctica. So you, you, you're, you're noticing that Antarctica here is not at this uh, uh, recorded here with this, this map that was, um, was drawn by um, uh, a Turkish admiral named Pyrai Ivan Haji Mahmed. So this, this map is known as Pyre's, Pyre Ray's map. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a parchment. It's kind of shaped oddly, but it's, it's built off of the 20 older source maps. So this, this guy, who obviously was a seafarer and an and explorer, <clears throat> um, uh, built and constructed this map very detailed map off of older much older maps and so this this guy is from 1513 when when this map was made so if you're seeing in 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 1513 uh that there is is iceless iceless land in antarctica and and land bridges th there's indication here that are what we see today in 2021 is much different uh, earth and, and, and geography than what we what would have been even in that time frame. And imagine, imagine much earlier on in <clears throat> post flood. Uh, so uh, Antarctica would have frozen over much later. <clears throat> and now uh, you've got another map here called the Erontius Phineas map of 1531. On the left-hand side here, you see a modern map of Antarctica looking from, from uh, below, from the southern perspective of the sphere. And, and then the uh, Erontius Phineas map on the right-hand side, they have the South Pole a little bit uh, uh, tweaked off, a little bit off uh, geographically, but um, for whatever reason, I'm not sh entirely sure about that one. But then you've got um, this. What's what's interesting about this map is 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 how you notice uh, it within this the mountainous regions. You have 
the indication of rivers, rivers, flowing water coming up from the mountain ranges. If you look at the edges of this map, you'll see mountain ranges and water flowing down from there. And then you see this smooth area in the middle, which indicates the forming of, the beginning and the formation of ice. So you're talking about uh, how the South Pole, uh, the, the Antarctica, it w went through a period, a long period of, 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 of icing over glaciation. It, it, we're not talking about stuff from millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago. We're talking about something within the, uh, the, the, the past few thousand years, if not even some hundreds of years. Um, and here's another map, the final one I'll show you, the, the Haji Ahmed map of 15. 59 and and now it's it's it you notice there it's spherical uh and and, and you, you see these darker spots that's your continents the lighter spots is water and uh and you're you're looking here more at the north pole and you're seeing look at the land here uh and the land bridges here uh so the idea being that that water sea levels would have been in this time frame much lower much lower um as as uh, uh well i'll get into this here in just a little bit but as 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 the warm water from the oceans much much warmer than they would be today as a warm water uh is is con um, condensated into rain and snow uh, that that rain and snow then falls and and uh, onto a colder earth and forms ice. Okay, and and so you would have seen a lot more land bridges in this time frame. So if if this is if these are maps, more modern day maps, all if you consider 1500s modern uh, and 1400s, but these more modern maps for us ancient, if if they're showing land bridges. And and, uh, and and prior to land, prior to some of this heavy glaciation, then we're looking at in the time frame of Noah, uh, 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 post post flood, a much different type of ge geographical and geological construct, making it possible. And here's where we're going with this: it makes it possible for there to be migration, migration. Okay. And, and for people to move about. So also, uh, our, the complexities of this map are phenomenal, demonstrating that if these maps, ancient maps, were constructed off of more ancient maps, we're talking about civilization. Uh, ancient civilization is very, very advanced and intelligent. They, they understood the circumference of the earth. They already had a grasp of that for all you flat earthers out there. <laughs> they already had an idea of, of the spherical nature of earth and uh, had great detail on, on local regions of every continent. Uh, they had detailed information about the shorelines of, of uh, the Antarctic. Uh, which is now buried in ice. They understood and used spherical trigonometry and had records of the remaining glaciers in Britain, Sweden, and Germany. You're talking about very advanced people. Shipbuilding is included in that. The ability to move about. Why? Tell me why in the world would, would shipbuilding not be a part of an ancient society when Noah himself built a ship? Noah built a ship. God gave him the design. I'm, I'm sorry, but the, the uh, mankind um, uh, would have had high ability and technology and intelligence to be able to do even far more than what we may have ever imagined uh, possible. Uh, we also see, and I'm just going to, we, we touched on this in the last lesson, but for Noah to be able to make wine demonstrates high level of intelligence. Uh, grapes need to have enough water. Uh, but good drainage, their roots will die if they're kept wet. Okay, so this, this is important information to know. They need full, strong sunlight. So vines need to be planted in a certain direction in order to take full advantage of the sunlight. Grapes with more skin and less juice are better for making wines. Growing them in nutrient-poor soil will stress the vines and produce a small, the small grapes that are needed. 
good rich soil would be bad in this case for wine making grapes so where did noah learn all this stuff so he could make wine and, and then eventually he had a little bit too much of it and got drunk he he had to be a very very intelligent human being who uh, derived his information from god himself uh and 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 as as god had talked with adam and eve in the garden and and perhaps interacted in different ways um, and this is assumption, but perhaps interacted in different ways with mankind po uh, pre pre flood. So, so again, um, not ape man. We're not talking about ape man. We're talking about extremely intelligent and and, and advanced society. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, again, I already alluded to the migration, uh, the ability for people to migrate at that time. So um, some Christian scientists estimate that immediately after the flood, up to around 700 years after that, the climate and the earth were still going through a great transition and settling down period. Uh, so during this period, the 700 year period, uh, we it would have included continental uplift, cooler atmosphere, uniform, uniformly warm oceans were ideal conditions for the ice age, okay? So as these, these things were formed, as these, this ice was formed, bridges were created uh, as roads so that mankind and animals together could move out, move out to the other continents, uh, uh, the Americas, if you will, the um, um, and what's it called? Um, um, Australia and, and those regions of the world, the islands. Um, you're talking about sea levels dropping and, and more of that water building up into ice. Okay. Uh, that would, as just a side thought, but that if we see a lot of melting of, of glaciers today, people call it global warming, right? If you see a lot of melting today, what's that going to do to our sea levels? Um, maybe I should invest in a house a little bit further away from the, <laughs> from the beaches. I don't know. <clears throat> so our sea levels would theoretically rise as, as the, these ice glaciers begin to melt uh, once again. Um, so we see again that God glorified in this. Uh, the psalmist captures it by saying, you set the boundaries of earth and you made both summer and winter. He glorifies God and said, this is God's hand at work here, uh, designing earth in such a way that it facilitated the migration of people from Mount Ararat where Noah landed uh, into all the world because God said to them, didn't he not uh, spread out, um, fill the earth. And, and so these people could have taken with them uh, as, as they were obedient to God, take with them animals uh, on their journeys, animals that uh, uh, were yet tame. They would, these animals would still, the first generation or the, the generation, the generation post flood that was on the ark would have been tame. God had told Noah that there's going to be fear. Animals are going to fear mankind. But you're talking about uh, during this period of a uh, 700 year period of, uh, of transition. But the immediate animals that came off of the ark would be uh, comfortable around uh, Noah and his family. They'd be best of friends. Um, they would know each other. They would have spent hours and days and, and months together on this ark. So for man to uh, to walk with animal together and migrate around the world was 100% feasible. And, and I believe that is indeed what happened. Um, <clears throat> as certain, certain groups took certain animals to different areas of the world. <clears throat> so what, what, where does man get this idea of cavemen anyway? Because uh, is there evidence of cavemen? Yes, there's evidence of uh of, of man who has been stressed, his physical stress uh, by his environment. Indeed, that is not, no one's denying that. No Christian is denying that. Uh, can we call them cavemen? To a certain degree, we can, because has not man lived in caves? Of course. Uh, man has found many ways of, 
of uh, surviving their extreme environment. So uh, were, were, were there ancient um, uh, cave dwellers? Of course, no one's denying that. But did they were they evolved from monkeys? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We're looking at uh, highly intelligent man uh, becoming extremely stressed by their environment. If you're going to take, if you're going to migrate across continents, hundreds and thousands of miles, walking, traveling, having children, uh, bringing more children into the world, dealing with new uh, realities, uh, wild of a wild earth at that time, <clears throat> uninhabited. I think, I think, uh, I think your body would feel the weight of that. You, have you ever seen photographs of a person? Have you ever compared a photograph uh, between a person who's raised in in like a pristine? pristine environment of, of wealth and privilege and, and uh, away from the sun and hard labor compared to a photo of someone who's been exposed to practically slave labor under the sun. Their faces, the faces of one is extremely wrinkled and, and, and leathery. Another one is uh, kind of like, like, you know, uh, you see in the magazines where, where uh, 40, 50, 60 year olds still look like 20 year olds. And, and uh, so you see that our environment does play an effect on our bodies. And if you're exposed to extreme conditions, um, uh, like the Ache that I grew up with, you, you could tell their, their, their bodies were were uh, developed uh, uh, certain characteristics because of the environment that they lived in. For example, the the men ha have really big chests, and and, and it's because I, I think over time, you know, th these guys are pulling back very powerful bows and long arrows, and they're they're living through um, by by survival off of wild animals and hunting. And uh, you, if, you, if you're talking about thousands of years of exposure in, in such environments, you're, you're gonna see uh, uh, different shifts in, in how their bodies react to the conditions. So yes, uh, that, that's, that's what so, some of the things that people nowadays say, oh, these guys are ape man. No, they're not ape primitive man. They're, uh, they're, they're just extremely stressed bodies uh, reacting to their environment. Even Job uh, alluded to this. He, he, he says they are gaunt from poverty and hunger. They claw the dirt, dry ground and, and des in desolate wetlands. They pluck wild greens from among the bushes and eat from the roots of broom trees. They are driven from human society society and people shout at them as if they were thieves so now they live in frightening ravines in caves and among rocks and they sound like animals howling among the bushes huddled together beneath the nettles they are nameless fools outcasts from society the bible talks about these people who are who are shunned from from the rest of society and because uh, you, you, you're talking about Job here, who is actually post, uh, well, most likely, I don't know if he was post Babel or, or right around the time of ba the Tower of Babel, but you're seeing some, uh, some, some of the, uh, a glimpse, I should say, into this time frame in society. So the point here is, is that the Bible does offer explanation. That's where we're going with this. The Bible offers a narrative that makes sense. People say, no, I can't believe the Bible because it's a bunch of fairy tales. No, it is not. It is a historical narrative, and we can indeed reconstruct uh, at least enough information to give us the confidence that we need that, that the Bible and God's word is indeed true and, and it upholds in a scientific lab, not just something that is, is enclosed into this church and religious environment where I go, this is my faith life, and, but my scientific natural life is different. I separate the two. No, you can't do that. Uh, faith and, 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 and science and, and nature are one. You can't separate the two. They're holistic. They're one. 
and and uh, you can't segregate it. So here's a couple of other things like uh, so just like human beings were stressed and 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 leaving the ark, so did the animals. These animals, these were great animals that God had made from from pre pre uh, Noahic times. Uh, so they're coming onto the ark too, and 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 they're coming off of the ark, and they're having to adjust to this new environment. So why it, it makes perfect sense why you have these woolly mammoths that were that still had green grass uh, in their stomachs uh, as they were frozen into glaciers. That makes perfect sense as these extreme environments uh, were, were, were taking place in this transitional period between uh, Noah and, and, and 700 years after the flood. The same goes for dinosaurs. Um, there were dinosaurs post-flood. Uh, dinosaurs appear in, in multiple descriptions in, in, in folklore. Uh, you've heard of dragons. Well, these dragons were real to people. It's not, it's not this uh, um, lore only. These were uh, eye, eye uh, witness accounts and written uh, of, of these fantastic animals that we don't see today that are dinosauric, you know, they're, they're reptilian. Um, so you had dinosaurs coming off of the ark and, 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 uh, and, and the Bible uh, supports that. Look at, uh, let's look again at Job who happened to be from that time frame pre Moses. So Moses writes the Pentateuch. Um, and we're looking at Job as one of the oldest, oldest uh, written accounts uh, within history, oldest oldest portion of scripture that we have. Uh, he says here, take a look at behemoth. So it's just using a different name, but look at this fantastic animal. It says, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins. Wow. Okay. And its muscles, muscles of its belly. Its tail is strong as cedar. Its sinews of its thighs are knitted tightly together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. It's, it is a prime example of God's handiwork. And, it's only cre and only its creator can threaten it. Uh, you're, talking, you're talking a, a description of, of a brontosaurus here. Um, and, and like uh, animals that were much like that. So, um, so indeed, the, the environment of that time was very, very different. Uh, I'll continue reading Job as, as it's talking about nature here. The mountains offer it their best food where all the wild animals play. It lies under the lotus plants hidden by the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants give it shade among the willows beside the stream and it's not disturbed by raging river, not concerned with the swelling Jordan uh, as, as this, when the swelling Jordan rushes around it, no one can catch it off guard or put a ring in its nose and lead it away. Again, you're talking this, this, this amazing animal, uh, which lived in that time frame. Um, so again, let's, let's go back to the genealogy here and, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to close, I'm going to bring this genealogy aspect to a close, uh, and, and we're going to save the story and account of Babel for the part B of this lesson. But look at, look at how, uh, quickly global amnesia was introduced into into society from that time frame how quickly they forgot all right so this time frame here that you see on the screen offers 10 generations all die within a span of 190 years 10 generations die off in a span of two decades or two two centuries that, that is that is mind boggling. You, if if things were not written, you would all the knowledge of Noah would have been lost, the knowledge of Shem erased. Um, if these things were not written down, so very few things were written down, and uh, and has been lost as a result. But you're talking about how quickly uh, things would have shifted. Uh, culturally and and in their understanding of God at that time. So what? Why is this important? Because people 
people forgot God. They, 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 they did not pass on from generation to generation who God was, his goodness to, uh, to mankind, to Adam and Eve, the story of the fall, uh, why, why judgment was brought uh, as a flood. The, these people intentionally moved away from God and developed their own religion and explanation to reality at that time. So this is, a, this is an amnesia, an intentional amnesia. Um, this just demonstrates why it's so important for us as parents and grandparents to be able to um, uh, to be able to pass on information to our children about God. Uh, if we don't, we're going to lose each each generation. You and I have to be proactive about teaching our children. If we have grandchildren, be aggressive about teaching your grandchildren. It's important. It's between life and death that you do this. Um, life, because God is the giver of life. And if we move away from him, we will live under the curse of sin and consequently an eternity without God. Let's, let's be proactive and even aggressive. Let's not turn off our, our kids and, and push them away, but let's indeed pursue them in love and teach them and pass on information lest we we experience what Adam and Eve experienced, and then Noah and his descendants experienced, and so many others have experienced. Let's learn from them and not have this, this uh, amnesia, which is so prevalent. Um, so the task that is given to Noah uh, was to fill the earth. God blessed Noah and his sons and told him, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. This is the same responsibility he gave to Adam and Eve, fill the earth. I, I want my glory, those who are created in my image, to fill the earth, go all over the world, and, and uh, shine for me, be, be reflections of my glory in, in all of creation, and, and worship me. And, and, and God commands mankind to, to fill the earth. Does, Adam, do, does, does Noah and his descendants obey? Do they obey? we find that they indeed did fill the earth. They did indeed fill the earth, but it wasn't because they, <laughs> they wanted to. It, it, was, it was an upward hill battle, and God had to intervene because of their disobedience. Um, so we see the descendants of Shem uh, remained in the, this Middle East Asian area. Uh, Ham as well, some of his descendants remained in the Middle East area and also moved into Mediterranean and African uh, continent. And then Japheth and his family uh, moved more into a European context, and then Asia. So, so we see that indeed there was a migration, a great migration that took place where the earth was divided, and mankind was, was spread out and, and uh, scattered. Um, but it took God's intervention to scatter. It took God's intervention to scatter, not willful and, and, and um, intentional obedience. I'm going to close with this. If, if God is, is asking us as believers to fill the earth with his gospel today and make disciples of all nations today, we need to be about our business or he will indeed intervene. He will intervene if we're not scattering intentionally. All right, so let's let's uh, look at Babel for next uh, next part of this lesson seven and uh, and and then the final uh, lesson eight will 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 have an overview of all that we've learned up to this point.